Ladies and gentlemen, we're back with class number 12 of the Obsession Beast Parent Education Level 1 course. With class 12, we're going to be discussing what position should your child play in youth development. Now, with this, and I got to like start this class with this because almost everybody thinks that their child's very good. You might be that one parent that says no. You're the exception to the rule. Um, again, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but the point is a lot of people that I have spoken to think that their child is the next superstar. Cool. So everyone thinks their player is the next superstar forward or just superstar player, like the next Ronaldo, next Messi, so on and so forth. Here's the deal. You need to answer this question for yourself. And seriously, do you believe that your child is the next generational superstar? So that would be like a Phil Foden, Marcus Rashford, Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Kylian Mbappe. Those are generational superstars. And they're pros, 15, 16, 17 years old, and by pro, I mean at the highest level, one, and then two, is that they play significant minutes already while they're getting in. Another one would be like Endrick, by the way, from Brazil. So, very important, because I don't think a lot of people understand this premise. And just for reference, this class should be shorter, because it's just get in, get out, get the points, and let's move on. But the point with this is, most of the world's best players, so guys that have played at the Champions League level have played a variety of positions at the youth level. So I've given you three names below, Gareth Bale, Rio Ferdinand, Ederson. Okay, so Ederson is a current goalkeeper for Manchester City, one of the best, if not the best in the world. And he talked about how when he was growing up, he played left back number three a lot. And then he transitioned to a goalkeeper uh, later on. Rio Ferdinand was a center forward, and he moved to a center back when he became a professional. And maybe towards the end of his youth career. But he was, he was a number nine to start with. Gareth Bale played left back before moving to right wing and left wing. So uh, hopefully what you're taking from this is players need to play a variety of positions in youth. And then as they start getting older, which we'll discuss shortly, then they can start locking in on a position. But even then, especially in the modern game, for example, John Stones. Let me try this again for you. For example, in the modern game, even players like John Stones, who's a center back by heart or by trade, even in, in Manchester City's current system, in possession, in the buildup, moves in as a defensive midfielder at number six. And yet, we're here saying that my son, or somebody's son, is that he needs to play striker, he needs to play left wing, he needs to play right wing, and he's a nine-year-old. Like, your player needs to get development, get prepared and get experience or gain experience. You can't gain experience at nine years old if you're only playing striker. You gotta play a variety of positions to learn unless of course your player's a generational talent. But you'll know if your player's a generational talent because they will absolutely just dominate on the field. Okay, now back to the class. So you probably remember the three zones, we've talked about them. Zone one is the, like I mentioned, the development and preparation zone with experience. Zone two is the opportunity window or zone. Okay, so back to zone one, you wanna be focusing on long-term gains. So this next page here that you see on screen should help explain the player positions and rotations. You might've seen it once before in a different class. I can't remember off the top of my head. Either way, you can see here from U9 to U19, the ideas behind the positions they should play and even as goalkeeper, so, let's look at it. U9, rotate positions. It just says rotate positions. It doesn't say every kid plays their preferred position. Rotate positions. Oh, and by the way, rotate players as goalkeeper. Ha, huh, okay. U11, rotate positions. Rotate players as GK. Okay, interesting. We continue with it. U13, rotate positions. However, we now isolate for a goalkeeper. Again, we're thinking outside the box, right? I'm, I'm not even asking you, I'm telling you, this methodology is thinking outside the box. That's what Beast does. Obsession Beast has you thinking outside the box for long-term development. That means your players are gonna have to play different positions and might even have to play goalkeeper. And that is okay. It's a part of the learning and growing process. Now, U15, play three positions and isolate goalkeeper. U17, two positions, isolate goalkeeper. U19, one position with alternative, isolate goalkeeper. 
And that's just the number of positions that players should play by respective age. But Coach Kyle, what about goalkeepers? Well, I would ask you again, what is the long-term goal? If your child is a goalkeeper and he's coming to you as mom and dad and says, Mom, Dad, I want to be a professional like Ederson, for example, in the future. Well, then you know what? Ederson played left back for a lot of his youth career before transitioning to a goalkeeper. If we're going to think longer term because of the modern game and the way that it's played currently, goalkeepers need to be phenomenal with their feet in today's game in 2023, heading into 2024. They're no longer just shot stoppers or guys that block goals. They're, they have to do that as well, but they have to be exceptional with their feet. Don't believe me? Go look at the world's best goalkeepers. Anyways, if you don't care about that long-term development process, then that's okay. You can have your child playing goalkeeper. No problem, or only goalkeeper. But if you're looking at the long term, and that's their goal, you're going to have to help them achieve that by having them play multiple positions. And I'll add this as well. When kids play 77 and 99, I have noticed a lot, kids that play goalkeeper as their permanent position, at some point, they kind of get bored, and they go, I don't want to do this anymore. So they try to transition back to the field but they no longer have the skill set to be able to do so. That's why rotating is so important. Obviously, that's kind of hard to do in current age of youth soccer because parents just want to win and clubs and organizations know that, so they milk the hell out of it, but they still want that. Now, looking at zone two, we talked about zone one again. We're back to zone two. This is the opportunity window, 15 to 19 years plus. This is where you need to be dominating your position and a stand out. And this is very important because people don't really understand that last point or I think they maybe undervalue it. Players that get to the next level, whether it's college or pro, are standouts. They're not guys that are just letting the game pass them. Players that get to the next level are standouts. Those are guys that are truly above and beyond the quote-unquote competition and showcase their level verbatimly better than anybody else and dominate the game, my personal opinion. Might actually be fact, but that's besides the point. So, zone three is the next level. Okay, now, I put my thing here on the bottom. This is my personal story, college. Okay, and the next level will be 15 years and older because you can be a pro at 15. Now, when I played college, I probably told you this before already, I played every single position in my four years at college. The only position I did not play was goalkeeper. So, I played number two, number four, number five, number three, number six, number eight, number ten number seven, nine, and 11. Now, I didn't play them all in one season, but over the course of my four years, I played every single position on the field. Now, I was able to do that because my my mental intelligence was so high that I was able to play each position. Now, I had a preferred position or a position that I felt that I could excel at, which was a six or an eight, depending on how the team played. If the team played with a playmaking six, I could do that. The team needed a box to box. I could do that. And that's where I felt like I was the best. I could also play center back very well, even with my lack of size, because I'm not very tall. Um, but I could do that. And I could play fullbacks decently well. I could play wingers okay, but I would be more like an inverted winger. Or I could be a guy that delivers the ball kind of like Beckham. Um, I also played center forward. I also played number 10. So those are things that I did and, and how I implemented it was in my, my college career or how I implemented it in college career. Okay, and that kind of summarizes the class, so I'm going to go through the recommendations. In 99.9999999, way more nines, by the way, percent of cases, your child is not a generational talent, so focus on their development through a variety of positions. If your child is a generational talent and they are playing at the highest level, for example, and destroying it, then you know you could probably try and lock them in, but that's just stuff to think about because they're that good. You need to be okay with your player making mistakes as they're learning and they're going through different positions. It will happen. It's a part of the process. Remember that your player is probably not a number nine as a 10-year-old player. In fact, they're not. You might want them to be the next number nine or whatever position, but it's good for them to rotate. Experience to grow, okay? And what I just said is the last point. It is good for the long-term development to experience and play multiple positions. Absolutely. Experience is key. You learn so much more by going through it, even when making mistakes. It's all part of the developmental journey, and we need to allow players to do that. Okay? That wraps up class number 12. Without further ado, guys, keep working on it, and we'll see you in class number 13 momentarily.